Good evening. We'd like to welcome you to today's program, Sports Betting in New York State, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, sponsored by the Women in Law Section, the Entertainment, Arts, and Sports Law Section, the Champions, Men's Advancing Women Committee of the Women in Law Section, the General Practice Section, and the Committee on Continuing Legal Education of the New York State Bar Association. This evening's program will run from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., and during today's program, if you would like to pose a question to the panel, please feel free to use the Q&A tab in the Zoom portal. And at this time, it's my pleasure to turn it over to the chair of the Women in Law section, Kimberly Wolf-Price, for some opening remarks. Kim? Thank you, Ernesto. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for attending and for joining us today. Um, this is the program Sports Betting, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. This program is, as Ernesto mentioned, sponsored by the New York State Bar Association Women in Law Section, along with the New York State Bar Association Entertainment Arts and Sports Law Section, and we thank the other co-sponsors as well. Um, as it says here, I am Kim Wolf Price, chair of this section, and uh, it's my honor to be the chair of this section. In my day job, I'm the chief strategy officer for Bon Shenick and King. So as someone who watches sports, I would say almost daily in some way, and who has been interested in the changes to sports betting in New York State, I'm really excited for tonight's program. I'm going to talk to you briefly a little bit about um, the two main sections sponsoring the program, a little bit about how you can get involved. And then I'm gonna turn it over to this really fantastic uh, group of speakers tonight. So the women in law section, we're um, a dynamic group of attorneys, both women and men, and serve as a critical voice for women. Our mission is to advance women, not only in the legal profession, but under the law throughout our communities as well. So for those attorneys who are members of our section, there are a number of fantastic committees to get involved with the Gender Issues Committee, the Programming Committee, the Emerging Lawyers Committee, Legislative Affairs, the committee that organized tonight's program, the Champions Committee. Uh, the Champions Committee aims to engage and educate men on the issues facing women in our profession and in society, and the purpose is to gain allies and to make connections to further the advancement for equity for women. So please reach out to learn more about any of these committees. We would love to have you join us. And in the vein of educating ourselves and our allies, I really encourage all of you to consider membership in the Women in Law section. And of course, to attend our annual meeting program, which is next week. Um, eat, sorry, sorry, Ernesto, I'm out of order here. Uh, each one, reach one. Educating the community about the ERA will be held on January 18th from 9 to 4 p.m. and to 5 p.m. at the Hilton Midtown Manhattan. Registration is available at the uh, for all the NISBA annual meeting at nisba.org. This program will focus on the November 2024 New York ballot initiative to enshrine an equal rights amendment in New York's constitution. We're thrilled to have former Congressperson. Carol Maloney is our keynote and really an amazing group of speakers on our panels, names that you will know, and um, topics that are important to all of us. And this is all for continuing legal education credit. So we do hope that you'll join us. And I made Ernesto skip over a little bit. We do have a fantastic magazine as well called Wills Connect, which will be published very soon. And if you'd like to write for this publication or learn how you can read it, um, this comes out twice a year. Please reach out if you want to get involved with the publications committee or if you have a topic. And in 2024, don't be surprised, the Women in Law section will be focusing a lot on the Equal Rights Amendment. But we take um, articles on a variety of topics. They're not law review type articles. They are things that we can use as practitioners, uh, perspectives on practice and the law. So please do reach out to us. We'd love to have new writers for our magazine. The Women in Law section is always grateful for the support and collaboration of other sections in the New York State Bar Association, and tonight's co-sponsoring section is one of those. The Entertainment Arts and Sports Law section, which we affectionately at the New York State Bar Association call EASL, has more than 1,700 members. Um, EASL members have varied interests, including labor negotiations, eminent domain, bailment of paintings, land development, trademark, copyright, and much more. <laughs> the section has a large, active, and diverse membership with lawyers occupying every corner of entertainment, art, and sports law. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, <laughs> I'm glad this is recorded. Sorry. <laughs> Whoa. My apologies. 
<laughs> my apologies to ease all there. Mm. So members, <clears throat> Woo. Kimberly, would you like us to just introduce ourselves at this point? No, I, I think I got it. Thank you. Uh, members are also at every level of their careers from law students and first year attorneys to senior partners at leading national and international firms and senior legal and business affairs executives at multinational media corporations. So EASL is comprised of 28 committees and another great section for people to get involved with. So thank you to EASL and thank you to the Wales Champion Committee co-chairs, uh, Michael Barish and Deborah Kay. You won't see Deborah tonight, but she was incredibly instrumental in getting this program together and has been a long time co-chair of our Champions Committee. So thank you for planning tonight's event. Of course, we are also grateful to our speakers for sharing their time and their expertise with us and their talents. Um, and none of this would happen without the New York State Bar Association team. So special thanks to our liaisons tonight, Ernesto Guerrero and Simona Smith, who in the midst of planning the absolute largest annual event of the year, which happens to be next week, found time for this program today so that we could get it in before the NFL playoffs started. So in just a second, I'm turning tonight's program over to our moderators, Michael Barish, who co-chairs the Wales Champions Committee with Deborah Kay and is a partner at Barish and McGarry in New York City, and Pamela Bass, chair of the Wales Gender Issues Committee, who is a partner at Thomas Strowen, Waxman, Pettigrew, and Mail in the Hudson Valley. So now if you have a prop bet on the over under of how much long I would cough in this or how long my introductory remarks would go on, I wish you well and I hope it worked out for you. Uh, this upcoming weekend is wildcard weekend. While I personally prefer European football, I'm not going to lie. I'm interested in the NFL playoffs too. And if you took a prop bet that I wouldn't say the next line, you clearly don't know that I live north of Westchester County. So go Bills and Pam and Michael, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Kim. Appreciate it. Please have a glass of water. Uh, everybody, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, we are excited to be here. Uh, as Kim mentioned, I'm a partner over at Thomas Johan Waxman Pettigrew Mail in the Hudson Valley, and I practice in the area of labor and employment law and education law, representing school districts and representing uh, colleges and towns. Uh, definitely looking forward to share uh, the, mod the moderating today with Michael. Michael, take it away. Hi, everyone. And Kimberly, I'm glad you survived. Um, I, I thought you were coughing because Michigan just blew out the other side last night. Go blue. We're so happy for them. Um, this is a, uh, first of all, I'm a, uh, a lawyer at the firm of Barish and McGarry. Uh, we represent the 9-11 community. So what is that? What kind of background do I have that would possibly be of interest tonight? None, except in the 1970s, I helped run a football gambling operation at Swarthmore College with one of our speakers, Bill Squadron. So Bill is currently assistant professor of sports management at Elon University in North Carolina and formerly general special counsel at Genius Sports. In addition, Bill is assistant professor of sports management, was recently named to the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act nominating committee, which recommends candidates for the organization's board. And Bill was instrumental in uh, getting Sarah and John to join this evening. So Bill, for that, I thank you. And I'm also introducing Bennett Liebman, who's a government lawyer in residence at the Government Law Center of Albany Law School. He's previously served as interim director, the acting director and executive director of the Government Law Center. In state government, he worked for Mario Cuomo while Cuomo was Secretary of State and served as his general counsel when he was Lieutenant Governor. Uh, he's also been involved in the wagering and uh, racing board for more than a decade. So to the two of you, thank you. Pamela, would you introduce the rest of our panel? Yes, no. So joining us today also is Sarah Slane from Slane Advisory. Sarah has almost 20 years with various gaming and gambling uh, industry, uh, industries. Uh, she uh, actually started her own advisory services firm back in 2019 and has delivered multiple successful strategic business partnerships to leagues like the NHL, NASCAR, PGA Tour, uh, and, uh, and teams and media companies. Uh, she has uh, she is responsible for some of the first professional team market access deals and has driven uh, hundreds of millions of dollars back to stakeholders. Prior to her own firm, though, I think she became known uh, nationally from her work with as the vice president for public affairs 
at the American Gaming Association. Uh, and that was essential because she enhanced the gaming industry's reputation, uh, built favorable perceptions among critical st stockholders, including regulators, legislators, the media, and the broader public. Uh, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone to know that right after uh, PAPSA was repealed, uh, it, which in large part to her efforts at the AGA, uh, she became known for her leadership and she was touted as the face of legalized sports betting and deemed one of the most important and influential voices in gaming. In, in addition, she had a stint at MGM Resorts International. Uh, so glad that you could join us today, Sarah. She is included in Sports Business Journal's 40 uh, Under 40 as well. Uh, in addition, joining us today is John Sheeran uh, from FanDuel, and he is the Senior Commercial Director in the Strategic Partnerships team for FanDuel. He has over 20 years of experience in the sports betting industry. Again, once PAPSA was re was uh, was repealed in early 2018, he moved to New Jersey to join FanDuel and has since worked in commercial and strategic partnership roles. He's currently focused in league on league and team play, regulatory and key supplier partnerships, and aims to ensure that FanDuel plays their part in building both a sensible and a sustainable industry with the customer always in the front of their mind. So to start us off today, just to help us understand this whole sports betting concept, uh, Bill and John, can you walk us through uh, what Fan, the FanDuel platform and what it looks like? John, I'm going to put it on my screen, but um, I'm going to turn it over to you initially to sort of talk about what we're looking at. For those of you in the audience, we just wanted to start this off um, by giving you a couple of minutes of a look at the leading sports betting operator um, website in the United States, and that's FanDuel. We're fortunate enough to have John Sheeran, who's one of the um, leaders in the industry from FanDuel, to um, be with us tonight. But we just wanted to give you a little bit of a look because not everybody really may be familiar with the scale of what's of what's available in the sports betting market and what people are doing these days. John, I don't know if you want to add to that. Sure, Bill. Um, yeah, look, the truth of the matter is, you know, we've had um, huge change in the short time since 2018, since we've had legalized sports betting in the U.S. We've had incredible growth. Um, we've had a demand from customers for betting on markets that we probably didn't even bet on internationally. You can probably tell by my accent. Um, certainly um, not new to me uh, since 2018 sports betting. Uh, we've been doing it you know, for 40 years in, in Europe, effectively. And what we've noticed in particular is the growth in demand for player uh, level betting. That's the narrative that you'll hear everywhere. And it's certainly been true in, in the product that we've developed. Uh, we've had something called Same Game Parlay since 2012 within our group. Most of our competitors are buying it third hand. But what we've seen is, I remember 2019 when we launched um, same game parlay in the NBA. We had two, three, four percent of our volume coming on player level markets within the game. It was a cultural, normal uh, scenario for people to bet on the spread and the total, uh, the money line, the core markets, as we call them. Those three markets were the dominant demand for what people would bet on. And now you can bet on how many tackles Bobby O'Kerike will have for the New York Giants uh, as a defensive linebacker for example, and we saw that grow from that 3-4% in the NBA now to over 60% of our volume coming through player level markets. So what we see is a deeper level of interaction, a deeper level uh, a deeper level of fandom from the, the viewer, from the sports better, engaging with a product uh, in a very, very different manner than we might have assumed four, five, ten years ago. Yeah, um, let, me, let, me, let me jump in there, John, to, and illustrate exactly what you're saying. Because here you're all seeing a screen that some of that most of you probably would expect, right? These are the NFL playoff games this coming weekend. You can bet a point spread. You can bet on who's going to win the game. But did you know, for example, that you can bet on a darts match in, you know, wherever this is taking place, probably the UK, between these folks sitting in your living room in New York on your FanDuel account, right? 
And then, as John mentioned, right, undoubtedly we have some Knicks fans in the audience. So we know that tonight the Knicks are playing Portland. And here are just the basic bets on Knicks and Portland. But if you go in here, just as John was indicating, you can bet on all kinds of player-related betting. So if you want to look at player points, if you would like to bet on how many points a particular player is going to score, you can do that. If you want to bet on who's going to score more than 10 points, you can get a bet down on that, and so forth. My point is, there are an enormous number of proposition bets, and we haven't even touched the biggest growth area, right, John, which is live betting. Did you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I mean, our job is effectively to service all of these options, and that's why I talked about like the player demand. Effectively, the sports better now is wanting to engage with the product, not until the game starts, but the entire way through. And what we've shown and proven, we've done this with lots of our league partners, including the NBA, is that you know sports betters who are watching and consuming an event that is a blowout in the fourth quarter are over 40% less likely to tune out if they've had a sports bet as well, as well. So what we're finding is that deeper level of engagement that I mentioned, a deeper level of fandom all the way to the final uh, throw of the ball. Tennis, darts, um, we have all of these live events that are live all across the world, serving up options for people to wager on uh, 24-7. And, and, you know, right now, I would say that most of our core sports are probably close to 50-50 in terms of the amount of volume that we take live versus pregame. A little bit different in the NFL, where I think culturally people are are just more used to placing bets as the game starts, and that's about 75-25. But when you think about baseball, hockey, tennis in particular, and soccer, these games are heavily biased towards in-play volume with live updates coming directly from the arena, live feeds, powering our models that we've built, internal IP, uh, proprietary trading models that um, consume the data feed and spit out all the probabilities of all the associated bets that we're going to wager on or people want to wager on. Right, John, and you I... all are looking right now yeah. at a tennis match going on in Australia with, as John said, the data coming live from Australia with these numbers being updated in front of you and giving people the opportunity to bet everything from who's going to win the first set, who's going to win game four of the first set, who's going to win the second set, and on and on. And this is all just meant to let everyone know that what we're talking about here, the scale of legalized sports betting, not only is it reflected in the fact that in New York last month, more than $2 billion was bet on legalized sports, but it's not just on who's going to win the Giant game or who's going to win the Nick game. It's on multiple sports happening all over the world, on various propositions and live after the game starts. So it's really meant just to give you a sense of the scope, the scale and the size of what we're now gonna start talking about. John, I'd like a, a quick question. Can you give us an idea of how many people are taking advantage of this legalized betting, for instance, to watch an opening playoff match in the NFL? Huge numbers, Michael. We've had, I think in 2023, almost 1.4 billion bets wagered just on FanDuel alone. I think that gives you an idea. You're talking about volumes in the sense of, you know, in the region of, you know, 60 to 70 million on the national championship game in terms of volume uh, last night on a Monday evening. And we're seeing just huge numbers. And I would say, if you think about FanDuel right now, um, we're probably talking about three to four times that in terms of the legalized footprint in the US. So it gives you an idea of how many wages are being placed every, every every single day. I would say in 2023, we probably had in the region of seven to eight million actives on FanDuel Sportsbook uh, throughout the year. Wonderful. So I should just mention at this point that uh, where this is the New York State Bar Association doesn't endorse FanDuel. It is one of the leader in New York State. However, but we should probably just make that clear at this stage. Um, but uh, right now, Ben, could you share with us a little bit of the history of uh, sports betting in uh, in the U.S.? Uh, I'll try to give you the Cook's tour. Uh, the fact is that uh, sports gambling is as old as sports itself. It was popular during the Greek Olympics and sporting events in ancient Rome. 
By the time you get to the 19th century America, sports betting is popular really on just horse racing and boxing. It just hasn't worked. It didn't work at that time on team sports. There were fewer team sports and there were a ton uh, of fixes in a sport like baseball. You know, obviously we see that in 1919 with the Black Sox, but the fact that so many fixes made, made team betting in, in earlier America not a great thing. Uh, in fact, if you look at the 19th century, there's probably more money being bet on elections than on team sports. But the question comes into the 20th century is, how do you get people to bet on team sports? And the answer comes from the point spread, arguably considered the greatest discovery since the zipper, as it was <laughs> once called. And this, in, this is in the 1930s. Um, the, the origin is somewhat murky. We tend to think it was by a guy named Charles McNeil, who was a University of Chicago grad and, and a teacher and a better, and he decided uh, upon the idea of a point spread. And it was used by, in combination with a bookie out of Lexington, Kentucky, named Ed Kurd, who kind of combined the point spread with a commission for bookies. So you ended up with a 10% point, 10% commission or vigorous which meant you bet uh, the player bet a hundred and a dollar ten to win a dollar. And the combination uh, of the of the commission and the point spread basically made for made it possible for team betting uh, and betting on team sports in the United States. It equalized the lines. other before that, who is going to bet Portland against against the uh, Knicks tonight? It wouldn't have worked. Initially, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the line actually came out of Minneapolis and was known as the Minneapolis line. And that's why that's because while Nevada legalized betting in 1931, uh, people didn't bet legally that much on sports. And it got worse in Nevada in 1951, when after the, the NCAA point shaving problems in basketball, uh, Congress passed a 10% tax on sports gambling. So it, casinos in Nevada didn't take sports books. It was just prohibited. They only basically they only took horse racing, and meanwhile, illegal gambling helped a great deal by by television just started to spread. By the 1970s, you know, states started to say we want in. Delaware uh, tried a sports pool for pro football leagues. It was found constitutional, but somehow Delaware didn't know how to operate it and actually lost money. And meanwhile, since uh, Nevada lobbyists, since the legal sports operators were being killed by the by the illegal bookies, finally got Congress to reduce the tax on sports gambling from ten percent to two percent and make sports gambling profitable. And the major casino starts taking bets. You can think of Lefty Rosenthal, the gambler uh, portrayed by Robert De Niro in, in uh, the movie Casino. Legalized sports gambling becomes a profitable part of the casino scene. Again, states decide they want to get in. And in you know, early, Bennett, Bennett yeah. I think that's a perfect segue to Sarah right now. And Sarah, can you talk a little bit about uh, PAS, PASPA and uh, the court decision? Sure. Um, so yeah, so PASPA stood, stands for the, God, keep me honest here, prohibition, prohibition against sport. Professional and amateur thank sports. You. Of course, it, thank you, God. It's been, it's been a while. It was only just started to be referred to as PASPA. But um, so this was passed back in um, the early '90s under um, uh, uh, under the under Congress because they were worried about the expansion of gaming outside of 
um, Nevada primarily. Um, so that stood in place for over 30 years, but truly was a failed law because there was a multi-billion dollar um, illegal market that was happening outside of Nevada. And New Jersey was struggling um, just given all the expansion that was happening outside of the of Atlantic City. And so they started to pursue their legal case back in 2011, um, basically arguing that it violated co uh, state constitutional law that uh, the federal government would basically supersede states' rights issues. So it was a really long, hard fought co court battle, certainly. Um, they started, I think, in 2011, like I said, and then we didn't end up at the Supreme Court until 2018, which quite frankly was a huge long shot um, to begin with. You, the, the, the amount of cases that the Supreme Court hears is, you know, de minimis. And the fact that they ended up selecting to hear this case was quite a victory in and of itself. And then when we had the oral arguments in December of 2017, um, it certainly seemed to, uh, look like that the court was going to rule in favor of the state of New Jersey. So when in May, when they they um, issued their decision, they basically said that uh, it was a violation of states' rights and they struck down the federal law. But that did not mean then that the marketplace just opened up. Um, every state did have to pass their own laws then to um, to legalize sports betting in their state. Now, some states had already had laws on the books that if this day were to happen, um, allowed them to move forward. So New Jersey, for example, had, had obviously passed legislation that if the Supreme Court had ever struck down the federal law, they were going to be able to move forward with legalization. West Virginia was close behind. Um, so that's what we've seen now over the past, uh, oh my gosh, six years, is just the marketplace opening up on a state-by-state -state basis after the federal law PASPA was struck down in 2018. Thank you. And and Bill, can you share with us then, if we look at specifically in New York, how then did uh, the legalization of gambling start up in New York State? Yeah, I mean, as Sarah indicated, every state has had its own fights and its own politics, its own issues. Um, more than half the states have now legalized, although some of the biggest ones, which I think we'll get to, like Texas and California, are still not legal. Where I am teaching here in North Carolina, it just got legalized last year and it'll be opened up sometime in the next few months. But New York posed um, a particularly interesting challenge because it had a constitutional provision that was um, an issue that had to be addressed. There was some uh, question about fantasy sports tied to sports betting. So it was a very challenging kind of road that had to be navigated here. And initially, um, it was only opened up at a bunch of physical locations. So it was not permitted initially in New York State in 2020, 2021, to bet on your phone or on your computer. But then the um, various uh, interests that explained how this was going to be an enormous opportunity for state tax revenue, for jobs, that there was a huge demand, convinced the state legislature to pass a law that would open it up to mobile and online betting. And to give you a sense of the difference, in December 2021, when it was only permissible at a bunch of physical locations, there was $21 million bet in New York State on sports legally. In January 2022, as it got opened up to mobile and online betting, that very next month, it went from 21 million to over a billion. So that gives you a sense of what the pent up demand was and how, you know, people like to bet on their phones. So, Bill, if you're in North Carolina, which has not yet quite started it officially, can you bet in New York from North Carolina? So I can't. I'm going to turn that over to John. John, <laughs> I'm sure you guys have this uh, geolocation sort of pretty well nailed down, right? Yeah, you got to be within the state borders of a legalized state. Um, we have the ability to have one account and wallet. So effectively, once you register with us, you can register, um, sign up, deposit. You can do everything. Check the website um, from, it, within North Carolina. But the minute you go to place a wager, effectively, there's a geolocation to make sure you're within a legalized state. 
Yeah, so John, just we have Flat two pants. questions that I, from the audience that I just thought you'd be perfect to respond to right now. On FanDuel, how do you define a sport for inclusion on your sports betting site? Uh, that's a really good question. I don't know if I've got a really good answer, but effectively... Um, I can help you on that one. There you, you go. Go, sure. go ahead, Sarah. So it's a, it's a really, really good question. Um, it's actually done on, again, it's on a state-by-state -state basis through the regulatory agency. So I've had clients like, for example, Drone Racing League that um, not a traditional sport, you would say, but they um, did go to the state regulators and petition for the ability to have sports books offer betting on, on their sport. So um you know, it again, it the traditional sort of definition of sport translates pretty much nationally. But when it does come to there's certainly there's so many new emerging niche sports, Bill knows like cornhole, um, that it, widely popular uh, pickleball, um, mm -hmm. that people want to, you know, partake and, and bet, but there just isn't a precedent for that happening. So, you do have to go through the state regulatory process in order for that to to happen. Yeah, we we'll offer wagering on everything, um, but as Sarah said, there's state by state requirements. In fact, there's legislation um, within each state that governs what exactly we can do. The state of Pennsylvania, for example, it's defined as on on the field of play. So there's no esports or drone racing league. Um, those are the sort of leagues that wouldn't actually be permissible within the state because they don't fit the definition. Um, so we have state by state requirements that we we have to adhere to. But the truth is, at the back end, uh, we're generating pricing for almost every sport you can imagine. If, yeah. if you and, and in New York State, if you look at the the State Gaming Commission, actually has uh, on its website actually tells you the the sports that it allows wagering on. Correct. Yeah, and and Pam, I would add, I mean, it, it really underscores a very interesting issue within the industry, which is that. There are many people, including, for example, the NFL, that have argued for a single national law and that Congress should pass a single standard that applies everywhere. Because right now, and maybe John can even speak to this, and it's very difficult from the standpoint of the industry because they have to comply with, ultimately, it'll be 50 state laws. And each law is different. I mean, there, as Sarah alluded to, I do some work with the American Cornhole League. And betting on cornhole professional events is permitted in most states, but not all. And so, you know, it's very much an open question whether it would be, you know, a better system to have a single federal law that um, was uniform as opposed to, you know, each state having its own different laws and regulations. But how are you going to do that if Texas and California won't allow anything? Well, if Congress passed a law that made it federal, that would presumably preempt any state laws that either prohibited or permitted. Yeah. Bill, we just got another question and somebody, we, you know, we take it for granted that we all know every, that we think everyone knows everything. But can you just explain to us uh, what is a prop bet? Um, well, it, it's really a bet, as John kind of referred to a little bit earlier, and maybe I'll defer to him in a second, but it's a bet on any um, sort of non- result of the game oriented bet it can be anything as it can be whether Steph Curry is going to score more or less than 12 points in the third quarter it can be whether um a kickoff at the start of the playoff game this weekend is going to go into the end zone or be returned it's essentially any um subset kind of bet around an individual athlete or a particular play. It can be on whether the next drive by the Dolphins will have, you know, more or fewer than three passes in the drive. I mean, am I describing it uh, right, John? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I would describe it. I think everyone has a different, a different definition. For me, I would split them up into prop bets and player props. So obviously the player props being anything related to the personal individual performance and then a prop bet being any derivative within the game um, that isn't tied to the outcome of the core market. So Ernesto, if you could just put up our uh, uh, the the survey for us. So a prop bet, for example, could end up being uh, what color is the Gatorade that is thrown at the uh, at the winning coach at the end of the game, right? So if anybody wants to participate, feel free. You can uh, 
you can vote. I know that uh, us as panelists can't vote, oh. but if anyone from the crowd would like to participate, we can see who who you think is going to have, what color the Gatorade is going to be that is thrown on the winning coach uh, in the Super Bowl, for example. What happens, though, if they miss the coach like they did to Harbaugh last night? Did you notice they, that? But they only missed on the first one. On the second that could be one, a they different got prop it. bet. <laughs> yeah, so that'd be that had to be live, right? The game within the game. Prop bet one, yeah, no, they missed them. Prop bet two, yes, we got it. You have to again. This this reiterates the point that that that's been made by the panel before. What that nobody has a clear definition. In each, each state is different. So a prop bet like. This one would not be authorized in New York State, where a prop bet has to deal specifically with the game itself. You can't have a prop bet in New York on who the MVP is going to be in the Super Bowl. It has to deal directly with the game itself. You, you can't have a prop bet in New York on how long the national anthem will be. It's very limited definition of a prop bet in in the statute in, in New York State. Uh, well, it looks like we have a winner. But, but you know, I, th I, I do think it really does underscore the core point, which is that, you know, it, it's a real challenge within the industry to have to deal with every state having their own rules, regulations, and laws, and they may change. And as you alluded to earlier, the tax rates vary tremendously. I mean, since PASPA was overruled and sports betting legalization began to take place in state after state, there's been over $4 billion in state taxes collected. I mean, money that's going to education, healthcare, infrastructure, et cetera, that didn't happen before. Jobs, huge amounts of growth in an industry. And I think people need to recognize that but the tax rates differ tremendously. I mean, New York has a tax rate of 51%, which is, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but I think either the highest or second highest in the country. It's among the highest. Um, it's definitely very high, just given the number of participants in the state. So there's seven sports bet operators in New York. Um, higher tax rates do happen in like states like New Hampshire, but there's only one um, operator there. So it sort of cor correlates to, typically it correlates to the number of operators that are able to be in the state. But, um, you know, New York is New York, right? So at one point during the process, when the operators were bidding to be in the state, they were talking about paying 64%. So, um, but now they only wanted it limited to four operators. They opened it up to seven and they dropped the tax rate. But um, it wasn't just the tax rate. It was also the license fee. I think it was a $25 million license yes. fee yeah. they had to pay. So um, yeah, while it's like ex it's extremely high, I, I can't think of another business that would go into a state knowing that 51% um, of their, their profit and proceeds were going to go back to the state, but it is uh, a huge market and you know, I think a lot of the times operators go into it thinking like, well, we the, the most important part is opening up the market and then we'll work on lowering the tax rate. Um, there's definitely a concerted effort right now to even add iGaming um, in the state of New York. So that would be able to be, that would be casino style games um, outside of just sports betting. Um, and that is definitely a huge revenue generator uh, in addition to sports betting. So yeah, I think it, Crazy high tax rate, but again, not terribly surprised that the operators ended up going with it. And and to give a point of reference in North Carolina, where uh, it'll it'll um, start being uh, an open market um, in the next couple of months, the tax rate's eighteen percent. The New York it it looks like from for the calendar year that New York raised eight hundred and seventy million dollars uh, from the tax rate in twenty twenty three. And, and where did that money go? It goes to education, except 1%. 1% goes to youth sports, and 1% goes to problem gambling. Well, we'll talk about problem gambling in a minute, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't spend a little time talking about the history of sports gambling in women's sports and its effect on the popularity of women's sports. So, Bennett, 
Would you speak to that a little bit? I can speak to it a little bit, but this, what we're seeing, there, there are so many things going on here. One is that the popularity of women's sports is exploding. You can just see it in some, in the TV ratings. I mean, if you see the TV ratings for, uh, for, for sports that nobody would have thought of before, like women's volleyball, we saw 9.9 .9 million people watch LSU play Iowa in, in the NCAA basketball finals. We saw 7.6 million people watch the U.S. play Holland in the World's Cup. It has just been amazing what the popular what the popularity has come from from uh, in women's sports. The explosion has been legitimate and real. Has it followed as much at, on sports betting by women? Somewhat, but not as much as we would have thought. I've tried to call up everybody I could to find out, you know, what what's actually happening. And it's a surprisingly it few per, the percentage of bets made by by women is far less than I would have thought, but it's expanding. It's maybe somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of, of, of bets. And it tends to follow what men bet, except that there's more interest by women in basketball, soccer, and tennis. Um, it's, but we're seeing a, a huge untapped market especially when you consider how popular women's sports is becoming. Again, I mean, it's not just the U.S. The most popular uh, last year when Australia played, uh, played England in the semifinal round of, of the World's Cup, they had 115 million viewers in Australia for this. This is the biggest sporting event Australia's had, has ever had. Now this market is only going to expand and it's going to get bigger and bigger and you're, you're just going to see a huge market coming for women's sports. And John, you know, I'm, I'm curious, yeah, John, I'm curious from your point of view in the business, how are you preparing for what Bennett just said about the uh, explosion of uh, interest in women's sports and I guess gambling on women's sports? Yeah, I mean, we we have a, a very conscious effort to, I would say, to invest uh, and lead the industry in offering different types of wagers. Um, we have a great partnership with the WNBA and the LPGA Tour. Uh, Amy Howe, our CEO, has been very clear about uh, a direction for us to invest and, and try and grow it. Uh, and I think it's been very popular. I estimate that we'll see about a billion dollars wagered in the WNBA this year. Um, it's big business now for us. We've seen lots of growth in areas like women's college basketball and the tournament for me a couple of years ago was better than the men's tournament. And, you know, having our guys focus and deliver and build, invest in new models that offer all of the prop types that we historically have offered in the pro leagues for the men's Sports is how we give people that opportunity to be able to grow. But I agree, the numbers on the WNBA from a viewership are certainly translated into sports betting and what we're seeing, the demand for it as well. Wow. And Sarah, have you seen a difference at all in terms of gender and in terms of either what's being bet on or types of bets that are being placed? Yeah, and it's been really interesting. I mean, obviously, the majority of sports bettors are, are male. And, um, you know, I think it's been sort of fascinating to see, in addition, I know that FanDuel makes a really concerted effort to target, um, I shouldn't say target, to uh, entice women to bet. Um, ESPN has really honestly made, I think, a big, big effort around that as well. If you've seen a lot of their commercials, uh, a lot of it focused around women betting. Um, you know, I think this is going to be the challenge for the industry is, uh, we're starting to, I, I don't, it's, I wouldn't say it's a mature market, but, um, I think that, you know, given that you have five years under your belt, everyone's going to have to get a little bit more, uh, creative and how they're, they're growing market share. And certainly that's a, 
that is a, a market share that is underserved right now. And I think a big opportunity moving forward. Yeah, the regulation, I would also say, kind of damages our opportunities a little bit. If you think about wagering internationally in Europe and Australia, we can offer wagering markets on will there be snow on Christmas Day? Um, we do that in Ontario where we're allowed to offer some of those prop bets. And what we've seen as a good um, way to acquire female bettors is a lot of what we call novelty markets. So betting on reality TV, The Bachelor, for example, they're the sort of markets that are huge, um, political. Like well, we, I, I would estimate that we would see four to five X Super Bowl volume if we could bet on who the next president would be in the United States. We did over a billion dollars wagered on the last election on the Betfair Exchange internationally, almost 80% of that coming on the day of the election. These are huge numbers um, that are untapped and, up, and opportunities that we're not permitted to bet on because of that state-by-state -state opportunity around regulation that internationally have been very successful in, like I said, acquiring female bettors and appealing to them more so than traditional stick and ball sports. Which is to... interesting as the presidential election, um, you know, they, I've, I've heard that in other countries that they actually use the betting as a way to detect if there's potential fraud happening in the election. So if they're seeing an, like an obscene amount of money that's being placed um, on a certain candidate that, you know, they can they actually use it as a tool to detect whether or not there's potential fraud that's happening during the election. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's an offering, unfortunately, that I, I don't know that I could see it being legalized, but it doesn't mean that it's going to go away. The betting is going to go away. It's just going to shift the illegal market. Sarah, I'd like to ask you on that subject. Because uh, you, we've heard or read about corruption in tennis, and the um, in particular, and how people throw matches, or perhaps know that there's betting about how many aces or uh, other things that are going on in the tennis match. Can you speak to the corruption and gambling, and how uh, that's being uh, kept an eye on that? Sure, and I know Bill can probably add a lot to this as well, just given his work with Genius Sports, but. Um, yeah, unfortunately, you know, there, there is match fixing that's happening. Um, and of course, when you think about where the, um, maybe the, the greatest kind of vulnerabilities are, I, I would, I would say, you know, college athletes that are not paid or not paid well. And then unfortunately in tennis, because it is an individual sport and unless you're in the top 50, you know, again, you're not, you're not making a whole lot of money. So um, tennis is certainly a sport whereby they've seen, um, you know, potential fraud and cheating and match fixing happening because again, it is on such a point by point basis. There's so many events that, that are bettable that, you know, even though you may not lose a match, you, maybe you're losing a set or whatever. So um, I know that, and maybe Bill, you want to add color to this because of your work with Genius and the the tracking that's being done to see when when there is anomalies and nefarious action that's taking place. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know, I think Bennett referred to the fact that you know there was and has been over the years before betting on sports was legal issues of corruption, match fixing, integrity. The 1919 World Series was fixed. And sports betting was not legal anywhere in the United States at the time. So in fact, the legalization of sports betting hasn't created the opportunity or the occurrence of corruption. What it's actually done is make it more possible to monitor, detect, and hopefully prevent it. So what we know, and people are familiar with scandals that have taken place in college basketball and other things over the years, that there are sometimes attempts to interfere with the integrity of a game. And it may be officials, it may be college athletes, it could be professional athletes, unlikely the top sports because of how much they're paid, but there's betting as we saw in that initial look at the FanDuel site on a lot of other things. One of the very positive things is that Genius Sports and other companies within the industry have very powerful um, tools that are done to monitor betting around the world. And Sarah kind of referred to this a minute ago when she talked about elections. And when you see money coming in that seems very unusual or 
you know, something that would not be considered a normal pattern in betting, the systems will detect that, flag it, and immediately trigger an investigation and an alert that will go to the operators like FanDuel. I mean, John will get those alerts, not John personally, but the company will get them, and they will have an eye on whether or not there's something amiss in a particular um, betting market. So it, in some ways, you're never going to get rid of integrity, corruption, criminals. That's a sad thing about our world. But by making it legal and putting it in the sunshine, you're actually making it easier to detect it and prevent it. Yeah, we've the, the vast majority of issues we've had it will always be tennis and soccer. Uh, the global nature, the sheer event counter, probably two of the main reasons for that. Um, what I would say is we've had incredible support from governing bodies, particularly people like the ITIA, uh, the tennis integrity team, who are the best funded uh, integrity team in any sport and globally. And um, what we've done is really been successful in uh, increasing the sanctions and actually getting everything through all the way to prosecution um, for offenders. Um, They're now getting you know, banned from their sport and livelihood opportunities for 10, 20 years at a time. And like I said, facing criminal um charges as well. So I think that's certainly improved at bringing it into the light, as Bill alluded to, I think has been the key element of that. And we've a lot of experience of dedicated teams internally within our group who are focused on finding those kind of integrity questionable activities immediately in real time too. I want to uh, go back to something Bennett was talking about, about uh, 1% of the profits or 1% of the tax is going to address uh, gambling addiction. Bennett, can you just talk about um, what has the, has there been an increase in gambling addiction since the legalization of gambling? We don't know. Uh, what we've seen over the years, what we've seen is a large increase in the number of calls to the problem lines. What, whether that means there's been an increase in pathological gambling, we don't know. It may simply be that the system is working, that people seeing the ads talking about here's the here's the toll free number to call are actually responding. It may be that our work in dealing with with problem gambling is actually working. We the, the issue generally has been in 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 pathological and problem gambling is that 1% of the population has pathological gambling problems and up to 4% have problem gambling problems. That percentage has not changed since in decades, even though legalized gambling, let's say 50 years ago in New York simply meant horse racing. We've increased that, the the, the types of gambling you can do legally by exponentially, and the problem gambling rate has not increased. You know, the basic belief is that when a new form of gambling starts, there's an initial increase in problem gambling, but it comes back, it comes back to where it was. Our problem in dealing with in dealing with pathological gambling is is not that we're not we're fine we are reaching people the question really has been and I, I used to give lots of speeches for the uh the, the compulsive for problem gambling treatment people in new york state the problem really is are people getting real treatment we're doing a good job of bringing attention to compulsive gambling issues we're letting people uh make sure that you know, finding a way out of it but are we really treating the people who have pro have compulsive gambling issues? And that's where our problems lie. I mean, if one percent, uh, there is there are sixteen million people in New York over age twenty one. If one percent of them have compulsive gambling problems, that's a hundred and sixty thousand people, and we're not sure if they're getting the real treatment that they need. Fair enough. Pamela, is there any other questions that have been asked that we want to cover? We only have a couple of minutes left. I believe we covered, and you guys can share with me, uh, the process for becoming an operator in the state and how long it takes. Did we cover that? 
I don't it, think so. Okay. If you look at the 20, we're talking an operator being a mobile gambling operator. Cor correct. It's very hard to say that because the 2021 law seemed to establish a, a competition under which nine under which nine groups are now part of the process. So that in order to be you can't you can't add to that unless the legislature changes the system. So what we've seen this year is uh, fanatics bought bought point bet to join the system, and and the main development for 2024 is will ESPN bet find a way into New York State? The basic belief is they will try to find a way to buy WinBet, the, the uh, mobile operator used by the Win Corporation, which has been trying to get out of sports betting in most states. And that's going to be the it, that's going to be one of the more interesting developments in New York in 2024 is how does ESPN bet get into the New York market? All right. And I have a final prop question for all of you, although John may not take this bet. How many times will CBS show Taylor Swift during the Kansas City game this weekend? Over or under nine? I'm definitely going over. It's amazing, isn't it? The game anyway, is on right. the game is on Peacock, so nobody oh. will find no one will see this game. <laughs> All right. I I know it's our time is up. Ernesto and Deborah, I want to thank you again for organizing this. Um, I think uh, we could have gone on and on, and maybe we this will lead to another webinar, but I hope the rest of you found it interesting. Uh Pamela, thank you for doing this with me. Bennett, Bill, Sarah, John, you guys were terrific. And I hope everybody got something from this. All Thank right. You all. Good luck in everybody's you. bets. Thank you. Thank Good night, you. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks for your insight.